Okay, here we go. Today we got Denny and DC Palter of Apposite Technology talking to us. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Tim. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. And uh, we're still resting from interop, or at least uh, one of us is. Uh, <laughs> Tim and I just pretend that we're resting. We don't need, we need a rest. Good morning, DC. Hey, Danny. How are you? Very good. Very good. Um, so uh, we're going to uh, get back on to the shafest.tv and, and doing a, uh, a technical presentation. Um, but I, I would want to talk to you about interop. Um, but before I do that, uh, let me uh, introduce Tim. Hi, Tim. Hello, everybody. DC, you, it's great to have you back, by the way. Thanks, Tim. You, you're looking good, Tim. I'm alive. That's the <laughs> I, I like it when you're alive. <laughs> so, DC, um, the, uh, Interop was good for you. Uh, by the way, um, do you always uh, name your product after um, uh, uh, Freeway? Uh, this product being that, the, uh, that it's called Traffic Jam, and it's about the... Um, uh, generating traffic and congestion, we thought, well, what's a good analogy for that? And indeed, the highways, especially if you live in Los Angeles, or actually most cities at this point, but uh, just outside of our window is uh, the uh, intersection of the I-10 and the I-405, the worst intersection in the world. So Yeah, I-10 I, I is actually recognized as the, as the, as the biggest uh, unintended parking lot yes. in the civilized world. Yes, and it goes all the way across the country. So uh, all of the models, and there will be multiple models, will be named after congested highways. So, so we should um, should we just just skip I-10 and wait for I-20? Is that is that? Uh... Uh, no, we'll have we'll have the the uh, I-95 and the 405. And, uh... <laughs> so so um, so that you, um, you so you managed. So that was a great story that you just you just managed at the last minute. Uh, got a uh, got a working prototype at the booth, and we ca we just caught you just in time before the show opens, right? Yes. And 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 um, so, what give us the status on the on the traffic uh, jam? What, okay. What, what, what um, is it? Well, first of all, what is it? May, you know, just don't right. assume people. Start, start from the beginning. Yeah. So, yes. uh, traffic jam is our our new product that we have coming out. It is a stateful traffic generator. If you're familiar with iPerf, as I believe many of the uh, people who watch uh, LMTV uh, would be, consider this to be a something similar to a professional version of iPerf that uh, has the same sort of features but is, is designed to generate uh, UDP streams and uh, TCP connections but to be able to do that at, at higher speeds and higher precision, uh, nicer user interface, easier to use, um, but also be uh, be very affordable. So the first version uh, is the i10. As, as you mentioned, it's our it'll be our small portable one and we're introducing it at a uh, special price for LMTV uh, watchers of uh, $500. Still wow. haven't decided what the final price would be, but the idea is that instead of using the uh, the freeware, you get something better at about the same price as uh, setting up your own freeware give, give system. Us an, give us an idea. I, I, I'm not familiar with with uh, with the competi competing product, but give us an idea of, of the, the price differential. For the, well, uh, what I mentioned was, the, performance, right? was, was iPerf, which is freeware. Yeah. Okay. So, Mm -hmm. uh, free to download, but you have the uh, the issues of actually getting it installed and working and um, working well. Uh, and there's nothing wrong with iPerf. It's just not very user friendly. It's not very precise. So we thought, you know, it's a great tool, but we can make something that does the same things and do it better at a at a very reasonable price. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now, reading reading the results of iPerf sometimes is the um the biggest crux to understanding what yeah the the output is kind of hard to decipher uh, so we're gonna have nice graphs we're gonna have um, you know a real GUI based uh, input um, all those sorts of things you expect on a commercial product um, but at least initially the features the, the feature sets pretty simple it generates UDP uh, streams and TCP connections and you can set all of your various UDP, well, UDP doesn't have many parameters to set, TCP does, um, and it'll have a few things that uh, that you don't have on the freeware, and then we'll be adding more and more to it as, um, as, as it goes forward. Um, but it also, you know, when you, when you install freeware on, uh, on, on a simple device and you try to use it as a test tool, it's hard to know whether it's actually working properly, whether, you know, when you 
they're trying to generate a gigabit of traffic whether there's other stuff going on on the device that's interfering with its ability to actually generate a gigabit of traffic uh, or 10 gigs of traffic. So um, the idea is with a, a, um, a built, a purpose-built appliance, we can do a lot, a lot better and make it more uh, professional. Mm -hmm. Right, and that and and when so we were talking already, so many people are so frightened and about doing anything on looking out over their network to see what's going on. And like we said, I purpose a little hard to read if you don't do it on a regular basis or you don't know, you know. But on top of that, you made a great point. People load open source tools on computers, but remember, computers are bus driven. So any application that you're running is at the convenience of the computer running. Right. And uh, that's not always compatible with the good test parameters, and that's unfortunate. That people right, and that, get over that. that was kind of the challenge we came into with our emulators. There are free free emulators out there, but they're not they're running on regular PCs that are not um, packet processing devices. So um, where our value add was was building our own appliances with our own real-time operating system that are focused on getting packets in and out with very precise timing and we could use that same uh, internal infrastructure to to build a traffic generator as well. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well okay so so uh, I, I think it suffice to say that um, that when when you're ready to officially roll the product then um, we'll, we'll do a live demo and absolutely and do a, yeah to open yep. that so, it's, uh, as these things usually go it's taking us a little bit longer than uh, marketing had originally planned for um, <laughs> and at interop we were able to do demos we had uh, the actual uh, product there we we're showing people but all of the features weren't completed and we had uh, quite a few people asking us well can I do this can I do that so we're looking to see if we can add a few additional uh, features to the uh, to the initial version 1.0 set before it comes out so uh, we're probably about a couple months away from uh, from being ready to do a, a pre-release uh, demo but well and, and that's, soon. That, and that's just about the right amount of time for people to really dig into what 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 uh, TCP IP and and UDP and, and, and yes. TCP is all about so why don't, right. get, why don't get, we get why don't we go ahead with um, continue your lecture then okay well let me get started with that oh, I gotta get my screen share going here it's probably, me... it's probably not a bad advice for people um, to really understand what traffic they inject into the network before they buy such a product right yeah they really ought to understand what TCP is doing and how it works <laughs> Um, let's. Uh, are you able to see my screen now? Yes, sir. Good. Okay. So let's go back here. Um, so we're on to episode five of our TCP/IP series, and this is where we're going to uh, continue what we started in episode four, which was the gory details of uh, the actual TCP protocol. Um, we're going to get into a bit. Uh, a bit more of the later extensions that uh, that were added to TCP. So just as a recap, we started off with the ISO layer because you have to talk about our seven layer models. I'm not going to repeat that yet again. Uh, went into um, kind of an overview of TCP IP in general. Uh, started talking about the IP layer, both IPv4 and IPv6. Then uh, last time we uh, we talked about both UDP, which took about uh, all of a slide, and then UDP, uh, sorry, TCP, which um, has a lot of details. What we talked about last time uh, was the original design of TCP, the the core uh, TCP, um, and what we're going to do in this uh, in this section is talk about the later uh, performance extensions that were that have been added to TCP, and then later on we'll get into upper layer protocols and application performance issues, but that's uh, for another day. So we'll start off real quick overview of what are the design assumptions behind TCP because they tie into um, why changes were were needed and how these changes work, uh, and then we're going to talk about four specific. Uh, changes, uh, performance extensions that have been added to TCP um, as we usually refer to them as RFCs, so 1323 large windows, uh, 2001 um, fast retransmit, fast recovery, 2018 selective acknowledgments, and 3168 uh, ECN. Uh, just as um, my um, my note says here, uh, for the people who are out there who are TCP gurus, 
this is not a TCP Guru class. Um, I'm trying to keep it as simple as possible. Um, that uh, I'm not going to go into the the gory gory detail. We're going to keep it one level above that, so that we can try to keep it focused on the on people who aren't uh, who know what TCP is in general, but don't understand necessarily what's going on between client and server. So. Um, you know, don't 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 hit me over the head and say no, you were wrong on this little detail. Because some of the little details um, are just have been simplified out of the uh, discussion, so that we can focus on the the general uh, aspects of what's going on. All right, that said, uh, let's go back to what is TCP doing and why. So uh, some uh, some critical technical terms. It's an end-to-end -end reliable connection-oriented protocol. What that means, and um, you know, we can go back to last week's uh, presentation if uh, if you want to go into more detail about. It, so I'm going to keep it very quick here. End to end means it's the two end devices that are communicating with each other, the client and server. The devices in the middle don't know anything about what's going on, or at least they traditionally weren't. Firewalls and accelerators changed that paradigm, but traditionally, client and server are communicating with each other. Um, what's going on in the middle is just packets being transferred from one point to another to, to reach each other. Um, and that's done at the IP layer. TCP layer, two endpoints. It's reliable. That doesn't mean the protocol itself is reliable, but is providing a layer of reliability. Um, it's running over a network that is not reliable, meaning the packets may or may not get to the other side and TCP needs a way of figuring out if stuff has gotten to the other side and if it hasn't retransmitting it so that uh, everything that was sent from one side is received on the other side. Uh, in order to do that it's connection oriented meaning packets are sequenced there's it's not just a stream of packets but a um, a real connection between the two sides that uh, everything that is sent from one side has to be has to arrive at the other side um, in the end in order. TCP has two functions. Number one, reliable data transmission. Everything sent from one side needs to arrive on the other side uh, in order, no gaps, no, um, no corruption. Uh, it also is tasked with making sure that it is fair to all the other TCP connections that are out there. Um, there's a lot of TCP connections going on uh, just from your, your one machine, possibly even from your one browser may have multiple TCP connections. Uh, there's other people using it at the same time. Everyone needs to fairly share that bandwidth. So TCP needs to have algorithms to, uh, to, to figure out when there's congestion and slow down. It's running over an unreliable network. Packets may be lost. Um, they just don't arrive at the other side. The, the network in the middle is dumb. It's not sending any notifications. It's not doing anything to reserve bandwidth. It's just either sending packets or it's not sending packets. So they either get there or they don't. Every packet can go a different route, so uh, you don't really know a whole lot about how much bandwidth you have or what's going on in the middle. Just either packets arrived at the other side or they didn't. And the bandwidth, of course, is unknown because you don't even know what route it's going to take. So that's a lot of things for TCP to try to figure out. So it's a rather complicated protocol. The way it does this, uh, it has a few different algorithms in there. So it has sequence numbers on each on each byte, really, but you can think of them as packet sequences. Um, uh, and so that it knows when there are gaps in the data that's arrived. There's checksums so that if the data is corrupted in the middle, it throws the packets away. The receiver sends acknowledgments back to the sender and says, I received this, I received this, I received this. And the sender knows what's arrived, and anything that doesn't arrive, it, sent, it retransmits. Um, the simplest protocol is you send a packet, it gets to the other side, the other side says I got it, then the sender uh, sends another packet. Um, that works fine and some of the original protocols were written that way but um, obviously if there's any latency then you end up spending a lot of time waiting for the packets to arrive at the other side. So TCP has something called a windowing algorithm, windowing mechanism, so it sends uh, a certain amount uh, limited by the amount of, of, uh, of um, uh, bytes uh, and can send multiple packets at the same time, all waiting for acknowledgments to come back. And then it has algorithms called slow start and congestion avoidance in order to ramp up each connection slowly to make sure there's bandwidth so it doesn't just 
uh, blast packets out on a congested network, and whenever there's loss, it cuts its speed down uh, in order to um, um, reduce the amount of congestion. So that was all of TCP uh, in a uh, very tiny nutshell. Well, that worked fine, uh, kind of, uh, when the goal was really just to make a protocol that worked. Um, and that was back in the in the 70s. But now we actually want a protocol that worked well, works well. So our first limit is the size of that uh, receive window. How much um, data can be sent at a time while waiting for an acknowledgement. And the way TCP is designed is uh, there's a field in the header. It's a 16-bit uh, field that says the sequence number of the packet that's being sent. Um, that limits you 2 to the 16th is 64 kilobytes. So that is the maximum amount of data that can be sent uh, to the other side while waiting for an acknowledgement. That was fine in the 1970s, but as we've gone to higher bandwidth connections and uh, actually trying to make things efficient, uh, we run into a limitation called the bandwidth delay product, uh, also called the long fat pipe. So if we look at an example here, uh, if we have 100 milliseconds of latency and we have our maximum 64 kilobyte window, uh, and a lot of times we don't even use the maximum window size. That's something the uh, the operating system sets. But let's assume we use the maximum 64 kilobyte window. We have 100, 100 milliseconds latency. Um, if we do the math, uh, it turns out that the maximum amount of data that we can send is just over 5 megabits per second. Uh, again, the easiest way to think of it is if our window was one packet, then we would send one packet, we would wait for an acknowledgement, uh, the acknowledgement would come back, we would send another packet. If the latency, the amount of time for that uh, packet to get to the other side and the acknowledgement to come back is very small, then we can send packets very quickly. As that latency gets longer, then we spend most of our time waiting for the acknowledgement to come back before the, we send the next packet. Well, what we're doing is um, it's not a single packet, but it's a group of packets, but we end up with the same problem that we send a whole bunch of data, we're waiting for acknowledgements to come back from the other side before we can send any more data. Simple solution is to use a window larger than 64 kilobytes, but we run into a uh, problem of um, the, the um, window size is 16 bits in the TCP header, and we can't change the TCP header without changing the protocol. And uh, as we talked about a couple of sessions ago, the, the original idea was we were going to improve IP to fix the, uh, the, the issue with the number of addresses, and we were going to rewrite TCP to make it a better protocol. But IP was more urgent, and so we focused on making a, uh, a next generation IP. That has been such a complete disaster um, in terms of getting it implemented and, and in use that the idea of rewriting TCP has, uh, has been compl completely thrown out the window. About once a year, I read some article in Network World or even in uh, other technical publications saying some, somebody somewhere has invented a, pro a protocol that's going to replace TCP because it's 100 times faster or a million times faster. Uh, and I just laugh because it's pretty easy to write a protocol that's a lot faster than TCP. You just start off with having larger windows. Um, there's a lot of other things you can do better, and we would have done better if we had written the protocol for the modern world. But we didn't, and we are not going to change it, um, because whatever we do needs to remain backwards compatible with the billion or so copies of TCP that are already out there. So. What we have to do, and all of these extensions that we're talking about, are essentially hacks to TCP that we fit in things that um, we negotiate options so that as long as both sides know what uh, are in on the game, then we can change how the header is working. And if the other side doesn't recognize what we're doing, then we say, OK, well, we're going to default back to basic TCP or the original TCP. So with large windows, we have something called window scaling. And the way that works is in the SYN packet, the, um, the sender says, I want a window size that's this many extra bytes, uh, bits. And so long as the receiver responds with, with its SYNAC and says, OK, uh, window scaling is on, then we use that value. And what we're doing is we're, 
we're taking some of the bits out of the TCP options section and using those. And we can use up to 14 extra bits. And essentially, we're just adding on extra bits. So if we set a, a scaling value of 0, that means no extra bits. So our, our uh, header size is 16, uh, 16 bits. Uh, we can go all the way up to 14 additional for a total of 30 extra bits. So um, what that means is if we had one extra bit, we go from 64 kilobytes to 128 kilobytes. If we go all the way up to the, um, uh, to the 14 extra, we get a total of... Um, uh, a gigabyte window size, and we redo that balance delay product calculation of uh, at 100 milliseconds latency. With a gigabyte size window, we can go up to 86 gigabits per second for a single connection. So we've gone from a maximum of whatever I said about five uh, megabytes up to 86 gigabytes. One day that's not going to be enough, but for now that's uh, sufficient for a single uh, single connection. So that kind of solves the problem. It must both the sender and receiver must be in on the game. So it has to be specified in the SIN. The uh, the other side needs to respond with the SIN act that says, "Okay, uh, I'm I'm in on that." Uh, and then once the connection's been set up, you can't uh, you can't change that. Uh, that's the first place to start. That's uh, that's a huge benefit for uh, for performance on uh, on TCP. Next one is uh, was originally RFC 2001. It uh, was uh, superseded by uh, RFC 2581. It's called Fast Retransmit, Fast Recovery. TCP um, has to manage how fast it's sending its, its packets so that it doesn't exacerbate any congestion. Um, but it doesn't really know very much about what the network is. The only thing it knows is did acknowledgments come back or not. So traditionally, a packet would... Um, would not get to the other side, and it, we would just have to wait for a timer to time out, and then it would uh, resend it, and it would say, well, I guess it didn't get to the other side because there was congestion, so it starts over from slow start and ramps, uh, ramps up um, uh, with each additional packet, and then there's another loss that cuts the speed all the way back down again. It works. But it's uh, it, it has some serious performance uh, implement uh, in, uh, some some serious performance issues. So what fast retransmit fast recovery allows um, allows TCP to use some additional information that it has to decide whether it has to cut its speed as dramatically. So the way it works. TCP is there's a full window there, so it's sending multiple packets when the uh, when a when a packet arrives out of order, in other words, there's a gap before it, uh, TCP, instead of sending a notice back saying, well, I'm missing this, this group of, uh, of uh, data or I'm missing this packet, it just sends an acknowledgement saying, the last packet I got uh, in order was, was the previous one. And so another packet arrives, which is later, and it sends another acknowledgement back saying, Last packet I got in order is uh, is the one a couple packets ago, and so it's, it just keeps sending acknowledgments for the ones that did arrive. It doesn't say anything about what has arrived, but at least we don't do know that data is getting across because it's continuing to get acknowledgments, and it would only get acknowledgments if a packet arrived. So what um, uh, fast retransmit fast recovery allows you allows TCP to do is if it gets four identical acts in a row, three duplicate acts plus the original act, um, it assumes the packet is lost. So instead of waiting for a timeout, it says, okay, I got four of these acknowledgments. I know that there's a packet in the middle here missing. Fine. I'm going to send it now. So it just it doesn't wait for the timeout. It goes ahead and sends it. So that's called fast retransmit for obvious reasons. And because three packets at least have arrived on the other side, we know our congestion isn't uh, isn't too horrible, so instead of starting over from scratch uh, from one or two packets at a time, it cuts its rate in half and then uses uh, congestion avoidance to ramp up from there. So we call that fast recovery. So that uses a little bit more information in order not to cut its speed as, dr as dramatically and be able to retransmit a little bit faster than it otherwise would be able to. So that's useful. It only works when we have a large window um, because 
even if the second packet was lost, it still needs to have four more, sorry, the second packet in a window was lost, we still need to have four more after that to arrive uh, in order to trigger this. So if you have um, a 64-kilobyte uh, uh, window and 1,500-byte uh, packets, that's, uh, I haven't do the math there, but that's somewhere around 40, uh, maybe 48 packets. So, and you could have a smaller window than that. So you need a large enough window for this to actually be useful. Um, if the connection is already ramped up um, uh, to a high enough rate through uh, slow start and congestion avoidance, um, it's still going to end up timing out before it gets the four uh, the four acts on uh, back to to the sender. So um, it works when there's a large window and it's far enough into the window that um, that the window's been uh, been opened up. And it can only repair, whoops, hey, we lost our lights here. <coughs> oh, you don't see that, but let's go back here. Um, <clears throat> it can only repair one gap in the sequence because um, we're just getting acknowledgments back saying um, the last one that arrived in order was, uh, was, was this one, so we're going to resend that one missing packet. Um, at that point, the next acknowledgement, if there are multiple gaps, is going to be the beginning of the of the next gap, and we'll have to get four acknowledgements for that before it gets triggered again. By that time, we've probably timed out. So um, it's good when we have a very low pack, uh, packet loss rate, uh, one you know, one packet every lost once in a while. For higher packet loss rates, we're going to still run into the, the timeout, which sets, sends us back to the beginning again. But that brings us to something called selective acknowledgements. So um, TCP really only knows the last byte to arrive in order. Um, we have something called selective acknowledgements that allows the receiver to sell, tell the sender that additional packets have, uh, have arrived. And again, this is negotiated in the, uh, in the setup. Both sides need to be in on the game because it wasn't part of the original TCP design. Um, and what we're doing is we're using the options field uh, in the uh, in the acknowledgement to send back a list of uh, blocks of data that have arrived, and it'll have the beginning byte number and the end of byte number for each of uh, of three blocks. And each block can be multiple packets. So if we look at our example here. Uh, if we have um, um, packet uh, 103 missing, the acknowledgement as uh, 104 arrives and 105 arrives will be um, that the last packet that arrived in order is, is, uh, is 1,002, but it can also tell the sender that 1,004 to 1,007 have arrived. If we have two gaps in here, um, the acknowledgement will still be um, last one to arrive in order was, uh, was 1,002, but uh, this block here, uh, the packet 1004, and then uh, 1006 to 1007 would be a separate block has arrived. So this gives more information to the uh, to the sender, and that helps out when we're um, when we have low thro throughput or uh, or low loss rates. For real WAN conditions, it's of so-so uh, uh, value. Um, if we look at an example, if we have a gigabit per second link and 100 millisecond of latency. In order to, um, to fill that pipe, we need a window size of at least 12 and a half megabytes. Uh, if our packet size are 1,500 bytes, there's uh, more than 8,000 8, packets per window. And if we were doing VoIP or mixture, that could be uh, tens of thousands of packets in, in the window. A loss rate of 0.1% means, uh, which is Probably, if you need to pick one typical value for uh, for internet connections, that's that's about right. Um, that would be uh, at least eight packets lost per window. So we can fill in three gaps, but every window may have eight or eighty or eight hundred gaps, even with a fairly low packet loss rate. So there's only so much it can do uh, for a high speed, high latency connection. Uh, and worse is. SAC is not a real acknowledgement. Only the acknowledgement is a real acknowledgement. So the sender um, cannot remove it from its window. It cannot delete the stuff that's already arrived to the other side because until it's fully acknowledged, the receiver uh, does have the right to throw it away if it runs out of uh, memory and, and, uh, and needs to clear up space. So until it's actually acknowledged, the sender can't clear it away, so it can't open up more space in its send window. So that limits its, uh, 
uh, effectiveness and also we're now sending more data back through the return channel if you have a uh, an asymmetric link that can be uh, that can be an issue that we're chewing up more return bandwidth Lastly, we have something called explicit, explicit congestion notification, which is too long to say, so I'm just going to say ECN. Um, <clears throat> again, the sender um, only knows traditionally that acknowledgments came back or didn't come back um, and doesn't have any real way of knowing uh, what's going on uh, in the middle that's causing the packets to be, uh, to be lost. So we have something called ECN. Uh, again, needs to be negotiated because uh, it's a new option uh, between the two sides and uh, both sides need to be in on the game. This is actually really complicated because it ties into how the routers are working. So traditionally, the routers have a queue and if more packets arrive um, than the, the, um, the router can handle, any excess gets thrown away. Well, that's fine. That's actually what the way most routers still work. But uh, we've added on some some uh, more advanced router algorithms that say, let's not wait until the router queue is completely full and then throw away everything that arrives after that because that just kills performance. So what we're going to do is beforehand, uh, as we're getting towards full, we're going to selectively and randomly throw away a few packets um, that. Uh, will cause the sender to slow down without having a massive loss of a whole bunch of packets in that stream um, and using the, a, a single loss to signal to the to the senders that uh, that they neither cut their rates and that's called uh, red random early detection or the Cisco version is weighted red uh, w red um, they get complicated. There's a lot of settings. You have to know what your queues are and where in your queue you want to start throwing things away and you can have multiple queues um, and all of these things need to be configured and most people don't know how to configure them so uh, and if you configure them wrong you probably end up making a mess so a lot of people don't don't touch them. Um, there's a lot of debate among router people whether you know these things absolutely must be configured, must be used for good performance and people will say I'm not going to touch that. So whether it's uh, I would I'd be interested in learning from uh, from people who have more real world knowledge on that than I do of of how uh, how often these things are being configured. If you're using uh, Red or W Red or something like that, where we are proactively throwing away packets in order to signal the sender, uh, we have the option with ECN of instead of throwing away the packet, what we're going to do is mark the IP header and say, uh, I would have thrown this away, but I'm not going to, but you need to slow down anyway. That gets to the, um, the receiver. The receiver notices that and then puts that into the, um, into the TCP acknowledgement and say, hey, the, the router in the middle is getting congested. It was going to throw things away, but uh, he's being nice. He's not going to throw it away, but you need to slow down. Uh, and then the, uh, the sender uh, has to slow down at that point and respond as if the packet were lost, but the packet wasn't actually lost, so we don't need to uh, to retransmit it. So this reduces the number of packets that are actually lost. It's uh, a it's not a huge uh, performance benefit, but it, it's always better not to have to throw packets away and resend them and have a little bit more information. Uh, um, but it only works again if we're doing what's called active queue management uh, with some sort of algorithm that's proactively throwing packets away. And this is turned off by default. I don't know how often it's actually used, but it is there and a lot of people swear by it as something that's absolutely critical for performance, um, but I don't know how. The, the, the evidence is that it's a, it's a minor improvement if it's, if it's being used. And so we've come to the end of today's um, session on, uh, on our performance enhancements. Uh, all of these, there's uh, you can read the RFCs. Wikipedia has uh, information about most of these, and then Comer's book is uh, uh, is uh, is great that goes through these. Although it mostly has the same information as the RFCs, so if you don't have a copy of the book, you can find the RFCs very easily online. Um, they're not the easiest thing to read, so there's there's plenty of other people that go into a lot more gory detail of actually how these are implemented and how these are and and how these work. 
And uh, we we had this at the beginning, but here's a uh, a nice little picture of our uh, of our traffic jam, and we'll have more uh, more details coming up in the next uh, couple months. So with that, let me uh, let me get back to uh, my uh, let me turn off my screen share here. I uh, hit the stop button. Okay, am I back live again? Yep, there you are, right there. All right. That was great. Thank you. So, actually, a question for you, Tim, because I think you have more real-world experience with, uh, you know, I'm a TCP guy, which is uh, kind of end nodes. Um, uh, I think you have more experience of actually implementing the uh, the, the, the protocols in, in real-world networks. So, how much do you see things like RED and WRED and ECN being implemented into, uh, into both Backbone and uh, in corporate networks? Tim, we lost your audio. Is that better? Yeah. yeah. Okay, sorry. Uh, I don't see it deployed universally right now. Uh, I do see some people that are trying to squeeze more out of their network, uh, mainly large companies and, it, and what I call experimental analysts. Uh, but as a general rule, I don't think it represents even a few percent of the overall traffic out there. Uh, because a lot of people don't even understand the extension capability of TCP. Uh, so, you know, they just, as I think we talked early on, that uh, the general consensus is about 95% of the people that are in networks really don't know how to follow even a, a simple TCP IP stream um, because it's it's not something they do. They try to fight fires and... Uh, and, but it's becoming more and more of a demand, as you pointed out. We don't have, we got a lot of data to pass down small pipes. And we can't have a ping pong where I send something and I wait for you to respond. So I've got to up it, send a lot at once, and kind of pass and pray that I'm going to get it all through. And then, and then do the SAC. I see SAC deployed a little more than most of those, especially more, you know. Uh, and, and SAC makes sense in large windows as well because that's something the operating system people have turned on by default. It used, it used to be off by default and you had to know to go into your clients and your Windows machine and set registry variables. But now, for the most part, it's turned on by default and, and actually some of the algorithms are getting pretty fancy in trying to detect what the latency is and, and find the right sizes. So all that's being done without the users having to do anything. Um, and, with and better, um, routers. and better routers are helping. Well, the, router, the routers, because TCP is end-to-end, -end, the routers don't need to know anything about that. But for the, uh, for, for the queue management, RED and WRED, that would be, for the most part, the service providers. And I would expect them to, um, to be experts on um, the router implementation. I, I said expect as opposed to <laughs> anything, as I see you smiling there. But... Um, you know, do you do you deal with the uh, the the service providers, and and are they trying to optimize the the router configurations for uh, for active queue management with Red? Because that's something that the end stations don't need to know anything about. That's strictly the routers in the middle, which uh, usually the the big routers are where the congestion are. Right, I agree. On the the big companies, the big ISPs that are handling just end to end pipes, yeah, they're trying to use that a lot more, and they're trying to remember they. They tend to hold corporate communications a lot higher sure. than the regular users, and corporate data being pretty large, uh, now we're finding that it's only when you start looking at total overall ISP uh, data, it's not that big of a percent. They make almost more money taking care of the individual people, and yeah, they're trying to beef it up, but I haven't seen, I have only seen, oh, three or four. Trace files, mm -hmm. that in there. So it's it's, and you're going to see some corporate networks also that you know that own their own uh, domain, right. transport, uh, do that. But people have got to wake up because we got so much data to pass, uh, and IP. We're going to be stuck with TCP for a long time, forever. <laughs> Pretty much forever, at least the, the foreseeable forever. Right. Yeah. And. It, I, 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 
I talked to a guy the other day and he was showing me a, a trace file and he had done all kinds of stuff to, to increase his TCP connectivity, you know, his ability to transfer larger windows and everything. But he said, you know, all of a sudden I just don't see any real benefit for some of this. And when we started looking through the trace file, somehow, and one of my pit peeves is how IPv6 all of a sudden, uh, because of a rogue device or because someone doesn't know what they're doing, it suddenly starts taking over a lot of bandwidth. And he suddenly had about over 12% of his bandwidth was IPv6, you know, open sessions. I see MPv3s popping out constantly. And he had to go back and figure out a way to filter that out. Once he did that, then everything sort of went back to normal. And uh, so TCP can be configured. I don't think a lot of people other, as you point out, than the very big guys or the ISPs ever try to configure it. Uh, right. And, and TCP being end to end means it's both the client and the server that need to be configured. And, you know, maybe a corporate IT person, usually the, the applications also have control over the TCP settings. So it's not something that can usually be changed very easily. Where at least forever. with at least with IP, that is a point it's it's the router itself that's deciding what to do. So you can change that in each right. individual router. Uh, but you can also make a bigger mess that way. Yeah. So sometimes setting things up causes more problems. Yes. But I wanted to make one comment about your new traffic generator, um, your stream generator, UDP generator. Uh, that is, people have got to start testing their network uh, to try to figure out what's going on. And and uh, just by going and doing control, delete, look at the streams on your computer, that's not the streams what we're talking about in the comm world, okay? Those are internal streams in the, the, the PC. So having a device like yours is... People need to wake up and really start doing emulation, trying to figure out how their WAN is operating, uh, and try to get the best out of it, because you, you can only squeeze a lemon so much, but you want to get the real good juice out of it. You don't want to waste any of it. So, mm -hmm. I so um, with it. well, we, we, um, we should probably wrap this up, but um, uh, thank you again, DC. Of course. Yeah, and so it, uh, it's unbelievable. We're up to the, the fifth episode already. Yes. And um, time goes so quick. Time goes quick. And now, um, for those of you uh, who are watching, uh, I just want to uh, explain one more thing, which is which is um, uh, shockfest.tv. Uh, this the idea here is that um, what what Tim and I wanted to do is to kind of um, basically find a way to talk to the the the, the same community, the Shockfest community that um, we want to bring technical um, uh, information uh, to, um, to Shockfest. And, and normally we would do um, all the recording at the show and, and then we put up on a website. So, and Shockfest.tv is just another spin of that where we, um, we're, we're basically doing the same presentation that we would do at the show, but try to do that all, all around the year. Now, um, the show is only about a month away, and so we're going to be doing a lot of work between now and then. And next week, um, we're actually inviting uh, Gerald Combs um, to, for an interview um, and, and essentially kick off um, a whole series of show called LMTV Shockfest. And, and basically, LMTV Shockfest and Shockfest.tv, they're all going to be together. Uh, in one place, um, so we have a landing site for that landing page for that, and that would be, um, uh, if we do everything right, that would be advertised um, by uh, uh, our friends at Shockfest. So we should be getting a lot of traffic. Um, so we're gonna. Um, so one of the things that um, uh, I'm thinking, DC, is that um, it looks like we might be doing the the sixth episode right before the show, right? Because we typically in the past we typically do. Uh, one a, one a month, and I was wondering if we could piggyback another show. We could probably record two at the same time, and that has something to do with iperf. Um, and and the idea is is if if you think about Shockfest, and these people are the are the people who uses Wireshark, and Wireshark, if I understand it correctly, is all, essentially like in the receiving end of their effort in tr their, uh, network troubleshooting. And your product, Traffic Jam, is sort of on the op opposite of that, right? 
it, it's actually client and server, but the uh, but it does tie very well into uh, into Wireshark because you may want to look at the at the traces in the middle. Yeah, so I think I think we could probably, uh, in addition to the next installment of the um, the TCP/IP um, lectures that you do, I wonder if it makes sense to kind of put another uh, episode in there that really just talks about uh, traffic generation and Wireshark as a way of introducing your product. I will I think it's a great idea. I'll have to see yeah. where uh, where we're at and and uh, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I'll have to get back to you on, on whether, yeah. whether I can pull just, that off. Just a thought. It's just I think a, it's a good idea. It, yeah, it's all in the spirit of, of just serving a community. Uh, you know, the next thirty days is gonna be very busy and then right. you know the floodgates gonna open, the people come to the show, they wanna they wanna go to that landing page to pick up uh, a video presentation they miss. And then in there, they're going to find all kinds of good stuff, like this, the work that you've been doing. And I'm hoping that we squeeze in another episode that somehow relates. I don't know if it makes sense, but somehow relates uh, Wireshark and iPerf or Wireshark and you know just traffic generator, generic right. traffic generator. And that would, I hope, to lay the groundwork for the next episode, which would be product specific. So just a thought, OK? OK, so, that sounds good. I'll, uh, I'll so with all that, um, uh, 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 Tim, go ahead. Yeah. One thing. First off, this is a great thing, and I'm. It, you just put what about sixteen hundred standards in what thirty minutes, DC. Great job. <laughs> uh, if people want to, number one, at at Shark Fest, they always talk about TCP. They show you how to filter for it. They teach you a lot about the practical aspects of diagnostics and analysis. Uh, you can also go to Wireshark University. Lord Chapel has some great uh, references, and if you are a Wireshark user. There are trace files there you can open up and actually visualize different types of TCP connections uh, and IP events. So you can learn a little bit more about the diagnostics perspective of it. Uh, and again, if you're going to SharkFest, there's going to be a lot of people there from the developers, Gerald, you know, all the people there. You can talk to them and get a lot of practical, uh, you know, practical uh, work actually using Wireshark and seeing, and a lot of times seeing is a lot easier to understand than all of the variables that are out there. And, you know, visualization is always better than, uh, you know, holding a book and trying to read through it. The DC gave you guys a great understanding. Go out and learn more and uh, have fun if you get a chance to go to our Shark Fest this year. Mm -hmm. Okay. So uh, thanks again, DC. Absolutely. Thank you, gentlemen. Okay, see you soon. Just stay, stay, stay on. And then, uh, so with that, I'm going to sign off. Thank you very much. And um, hope you can join us next week uh, when we interview Gerald Combs. Uh, I, I have to, I have a, a confession to make. Uh, Gerald is probably one of the hardest person to interview because he really doesn't like to talk about himself. So, <laughs> so that would be a challenge and see if we can crack this nut again. Thanks, Sam. Thanks, DC. Bye-bye. See you next week.